Good afternoon. Today we will learn return-oriented programming, a general way to run any kind of code by using existing code in the program. The reason for learning how to run uh, code reuse is to avoid exploit mitigation defenses in modern operating systems. Um, from previous lectures, uh, we have learned the following defense mechanisms that are active in modern systems, such as uh, uh, data execution prevention, uh, which disables uh, execution permissions in the data memory, such as a stag and heap, uh, which ultimately aim to disallow uh, injecting uh, malicious code, such as shellcode. To counter this, attackers may call existing functions in the program's address space, uh, the functions written in the program, as well as uh, functions loaded in the dynamic libraries. So if DEP is active, uh, because we cannot run our injected data as code, uh, we must reuse existing code to launch our attack. We will learn, uh, we have learned uh, two other defenses, stack cookie and the ASRL, and they both require us to obtain the information about the random secret that each defense sets. So for stack cookie, if we can leak the cookie value itself, uh, then like it or we can apply the side channel attack to have the knowledge about the random value then we can bypass the defense or we can skip the cookie part uh, by overriding our data uh, with the non sequential override for AS at all if we can obtain any kind of the meaningful address that we can calculate the relative offset to the address that we have interest then we can infer the address that uh, 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 the sum of the return address or like a, some other like a function uh, function addresses from the off, uh, the leaked address, then we can reuse them to avoid the defense. And there are defense mechanisms that we learned in previous lecture and uh, participating. Yeah, and then you are uh, practicing avoid each of defense mechanisms as challenges in week four. But the real problem for today is that the modern systems have applied all three defenses altogether while you are just practicing avoiding each of the defense, uh, each by each. For example, stack cookie challenge has only applied the stack cookie, not the DEP, nor the ASRL. But in this case, like the, uh, we have the system that applied the older defense at once, so uh, you need to defeat the entire defense at the same time. Yeah. And before uh, starting to learn about the return-oriented programming, uh, let's do a recap on DEP, and then think about what will be different if we assume ASRL is also uh, enabled uh, for DEP challenges. So in the DEP challenges, your task was to call library functions such as a system, uh, open read write, uh, those kind of functions with the specific argument, for example, BNSH. Uh, that is possible because uh, ASRL was turned off in VMCTF1 machine, so you can easily find uh, all the addresses for these functions. But in the modern systems, ASRL is enabled, then you cannot get the fixed address for these functions. Then how can you bypass uh, both defense at the same time? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we can start with the, in an easier case first, so, and there are two types of the ASRL. One is a partial ASRL and the other is full ASRL. First, the partial ASRL means that the, some part of the memory layout of the program, this memory space, is not randomized. <coughs> in the most of cases, the program's code is not randomized at all, so we call this as this case as a non-PIE. The PIE stands for uh, position independent executable. And then this type of the position independent executable is an essential element for allowing uh, code be placed at any random base address. So if we do not have like that property, then uh, the randomization of the code and data area is not available. So if we have a non-PIE binary, so you can check that with the uh, pound check sec command uh, that tells you about like a security uh, features enabled in the 
target program and if it says like a no PIE then like the uh, the system will randomize the library heap and stack addresses but it will never randomize the code and data uh, uh, section for the program so you can reuse uh, some of the addresses from the, this fixed location however uh, for the full ASRL uh, the program itself is also position independent executable so the uh, compiler determines like uh, whether to build the uh, program as a known PIE or like a PIE and if it is, then the system will apply the uh, randomization to the programs of code and data. So in that case, we can regard that as a full ASRL because there will be no fixed addresses at all. So in week five, uh, we will learn how to avoid the combination of the DEP and ASRL uh, step by step. We will first tackle non-PIE challenges uh, which does not randomize the program's uh, code injection. So your attack will start with reusing a uh, program's uh, existing code. Then let's learn how to get a shell in such a case. In the first return-oriented programming challenge, the ROP, uh, the ROP32 and ROP64, your task is to call two functions in chain uh, calling a set regid uh, with the target group ID arguments uh, such as like the 50,000 for these two arguments and then calling the exe function with the three argument of bin sh 0 and 0. Fortunately, in the challenge, you can see uh, all these functions uh, in the fixed address. So the, these two binary programs are not uh, non-PIE. So you can find the fixed address for the like those function uh, address and then you can do that by attaching to the uh, by opening the file with gdb and then the, running the command info functions will tell the fixed addresses for that then how can you call these functions um, we need to change uh, two function calls and to learn about that in detail let's first take an example of the chaining uh, three functions in the when we saw the DEP3 challenge. The stack configuration at the first return would be like uh, this diagram. And then when the function returns, it pops the instruction pointer from the stack, so it will execute the sum function. And then pop means that the ESP will move uh, one up. And then when the execution gets into the sum function, then at the head of the sum function, it will execute a push EVP. So it will push saved EVP here, and then move EVP to ESP, and then sub ESP to reserve a new stack space. So this is these are steps for like creating the new stack frame, and then the new stack frame it will be created like this. And then after this sum function returns, uh, when this sum function returns, uh, it will execute to leave and return. And then how it works is label will move ESP to EBP and then pop EBP. So EBP will point to the saved EBP and then ESP will be here and then return. And then return here means that they're returning to the read function. So it will call read three buffer one hundred, yeah. and then run printf. So our attack first returns to the function placed in the location of the return address, and then if this function returns, it will return to this function, and then if this function returns, it will return to this. So by placing the address of the second and third uh, return address target uh, right next to the return address then we can chain the call yeah so the uh, return and then leave return kind of the mechanism will maintain the, this kind of structure so call some function first and then read and then printf and then it will fetch the arguments from the uh, stack and this process uh, is happening sequentially by the CPU so we call this kind of the uh, multiple function execution in a chain as a return-oriented programming. Uh, think about that. 
if we can call arbitrary number of a function uh, with the arbitrary number of arguments of our choice our choice of the function our choice of the the arguments and then the, uh, if we can call any number of the fun make a, any number of fun function call uh, then the, what we will do is something like a write a code using return address and arguments on the stack as a programming syntax but there is a one pro problem uh, we can call arbitrary function by putting any kind of address and also we can put the arbitrary number of arguments but uh, how can we chain arbitrary number of functions so for example we can chain some function and read and then printf but after calling the printf with the buffer as an argument uh, the next uh, return address so when printf returns it will return to 3 then we can ch cannot change this address because uh, this is being used as a first argument of read then our chain will stop at the third and also the reason why we can chain two uh, or more functions is that the some function does not have an argument at all so if this one has an argument then this space this space must be used as an argument for the sum function then we cannot chain three calls and also if the printf requires a different argument then like the uh, the argument for the printf is fixed by the read call itself so there are some of the conflicts between the uh, uh, what kind of the function call and also like the what kind of arguments we can have here so right now uh, this method cannot allow us like the choosing arbitrary uh, function and then chain arbitrary number of the functions and also setting their argument arbitrarily so that's not possible so let's get back to the wrap one challenge to uh, do it more wisely and then our task here is to run a set regid and then exec the e in a chain and to launch the function uh, we can first set the return address and then all the arguments uh, of the things like this so we naively put the set the, the address of the set regid first and then set the arguments for that and then we just put the exec b because after set regid call returns it will run exec b yeah. then let's check about like the how uh, it will run for the exec b so it will first run set regid with the first argument 50,000 and the second argument 50,000 yeah this call will be done correctly but when this returns uh, it will return to exec b then the first argument of the exec b will be 50,000 set by us for like supplying that to set regid and then second argument is xxxxx with that we can control y y y y for that we can control will be the third argument so we have a full freedom to choose like the, these two arguments so we can set it and set them as a zero but the problem is that the, this 50,000 this value is not a valid address at all so we cannot use that as a string for BNSH then we cannot chain uh, these two calls in this manner yeah so this is not the method that we can chain arbitrary number of function then uh, let's take a problem in a different way so suppose we configured uh, the stack uh, as follows like this diagram and because we would like to run the set regid and then 50,000 50,000 first so set the arguments and then call uh, like this and then at the return of the set regid it will return so it will call this function and then it will return to this location but what if instead of the xxxx yeah not exact b what if we put uh, these three instructions uh, address of the, these three instructions at this location yeah. so just follow the execution so there are two pops in return so it will first pop edi so edi value will be 50,000 and then it will pop EBP EBP value will be 50,000 but we don't care about like these values so these are typo so all the values need to be like 50,000 here yeah 
And then because the pop, the, these are pop instructions, so the ESP moves the one up, one up, right? And then it will return, return to where? Exactly. And then at this time, the uh, when we execute exactly the placement of the step seems like uh, we will we can put the address of the, any kind of the values at here so we can put the address of the bnsh for the its first argument and then second and third argument as a zero so the important thing here is that uh, if we have two arguments for a function then if we run pop pop return then it will clear up so the, these this kind of the instruction will clear the the very uh, the arguments variables that we place on the stack and then return to the next address so you can chain the uh, execution so simply if we want to chain like a function with one argument then we can put the function address and the argument then right next to there uh, we can put pop return then execution will be written to the function then return to the pop and then return so it will run next function and then if we have a function with the two arguments and put the function and then two arguments in here and then in between we can put the address of the pop pop return then function call return to here then pop pop return three arguments put the function three arguments and then pop 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 return so it will return to the function to here and then pop 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 return and then for the four and five six arguments and then if you can search for the like the uh the code snippet that does like five pops and then six pops then you can use that in the same way so uh in this case the the important thing is like the how can you find this kind of the pop return pop pop return pop 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 return uh, those kind of the the code uh, snippets and uh, we can easily find those uh, instructions because the push and pop is a natural standard method to uh, save and restore uh, register values when we make a function call so there are many pops in return uh, at the end of the like the function call and we can find them as a uh, rob gadgets and the reason why we call them as a rob gadget is like the, because this kind of the little code snippet pop something return pop 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 return yeah these are uh, uh, essential uh, to build a chain build a chain of the execution uh, to enable the return return oriented programming as a general programming power uh, with the general programming power and uh, you can find the such gadgets by running this program rob gadget uh, it's already installed in the uh, system so just to run this with the option dash dash binary and then the binary file name and it will print out the gadgets and then for calling exactly so you might need uh, these kind of the two pops in return to pop two arguments of the zregid and for exactly you can apply pop 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 return to uh, clear all three arguments so in summary uh, to solve the rob one challenge in 32-bit uh, your task is to configure your stack like this so at first call set regid with two arguments first and then return to the one of the location of the uh, instructions uh, with the pop pop return and it will pop to edi pop to esp and then return to exactly then for exactly we can set any kind of the arguments for the function then the next question is that uh, what will be uh, how it will be in the 64-bit architecture? Would that be the same or would be the difference? Difference? Would there be some difference? But there is a very little difference, and then that's because like the of the argument passing the mechanism. That is, in 32-bit, uh, we can just use a number of uh, pops and return to control and clear the uh, argument values because uh, all the function arguments are passed by the stack. But in AMD 64, in the 64-bit ADI, uh, we, we pass argument via the registers, not the stack. So to set the first and second argument as a 50,000, 
then we need to set the value of the RDI and RSI registers, not the stack. So value of the registers need to be set as the argument value. So we cannot place the uh, arguments uh, like this. That's because 32-bit, it will fetch arguments from the stack, so we can set arbitrary value here. But in 64-bit, we need to put this value in the register. But uh, we don't give up at the, with that restrictions. And then interesting thing is like uh, the instructions that we can easily find is like uh, pop some of the uh, some of the register. So we will use uh, these kind of the uh, instructions yeah, to set the register value in 64-bit. So in 32-bit, we don't care about like the uh, what kind of the values are like stored by the pop instruction a uh, pop register instruction uh, we'd run in like in this stage so we don't care about like the register values so just a pop and to clear the stack and then move focused on the moving on to the next instruction but actually these instructions can set the value of the EDI and then EVP registers then can we set the uh, register values for RDI RSI in this manner definitely yes so that means like we need to find some of the instructions such as a pop RDI and return. Then we can set put the value on the stack, and then we pop the to the RDI register so we can change the value of that one. And then for setting the RSI and RDX because the argument order first, second, third, fourth is this one. So we need to set the RDI, RSI, RDX these register values, and we can do that by finding. Uh, corresponding pop instruction. So we can find a similar gadget uh, by using the rob gadget dash dash binary uh, for the 64 bit binary file. And then, so what we need is like a pop RDI to set the first argument, pop RSI for, the set, for setting the second argument, and then pop RDX, and then like the, for the third argument. And the important thing is like the, we need to have the return. Uh, at the end of the pop instruction because the return instruction is uh, the instruction that continues the execution. And uh, how can you use that? Let's take a look at the uh, actual execution and then uh, think about like the, what will happen if we configure the uh, stack configuration like this. So. Think about like the we our RSP was here and then just run the pop RDI and return. So it will pop RDI. So it will set this value to RDI and then RSP moves one up and then return. So return to this pop RSI and pop R15 instruction. So it returns. Then it will run pop RSI. So RSI value will be 50,001. So we can set the first and second argument by using these kind of instructions. And then the next instruction is a pop R15. So we will ignore that. So we can put any kind of value here. Because our interest is just to setting RDI and RSI. Then return. So it will return to set ID. So the interesting point here is that in 32-bit, uh, we put the function address here and then put the argument on the stack. But in 64-bit, we need to set the all the arguments first before calling the function. So what we will do is we will find the corresponding the pop instruction to uh, setting the argument. Then the call pop ID RDI first to set the, this value to the argument. And then pop RSI for setting this value to the argument. And then finally called set ID. So we can make uh, this kind of function call. And then if we have enough of these gadgets, so pop all the registers and then return or something, then, then we can chain any number of functions like this. Then how can we call exactly after calling set ID? Uh, so we will do the same thing. So to set the first argument, we will return to pop RDI and return. Then RDI will be address of the BSH. Then pop RSI, pop R15 return. So RSI will be zero. R15, we don't care, XXXX, any kind of value. And then pop RDX return or pop RDX RVP return, uh, depending on the like the 
number of of pop, uh, we need to put the value. So set our dx is a zero, then call execd here. Yeah. So make sure that the function address uh, comes at the end, not at the first. So in 32-bit, the function address comes first, and then pop, 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 something like that. But in 64-bit, we need to pop the register values first to set the arguments, then exec the So the final exploit for the ROP 164 would look like the stack starts with the pop RDI return. So it will set the, this as a first argument, RSI for this value, R15 for the, this value, and then return to set regid to call set regid 50,001, 50,001. And then it will return to pop RDI and return to set the address of the BNSH to the first argument and then set RSI as a zero, ignore R15, and then set RDX as a zero, and then call execve. Yeah. Then you can run uh, execve with the, these three as an argument. And after finishing uh, ROP1, 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, uh, the ROP2 challenges are the little advanced. So the task is, you need to chain three calls, uh, open, read, and write. And what you will open is like the flag file, definitely. And then read from the flag file and then write that out to the console. So the task will be very similar to DEP3, but it requires you to pop some registers to set the values to them or like the clear the stack for the like the passing the argument correctly. And that requires a finding ROP gadgets. And to find that, please use the tool ROP gadget dash dash binary and the program name. And for these challenges in uh, week four, uh, I hosted them in like a VMCTF2 server. So please connect to that server. And the challenges in the week five directory. So you can use the fetch command, a fetch week five, uh, to get all the uh, challenge and popping out, uh, populate all the directory for the uh, challenges. And the ROP1 challenge is just calling set regid and then exec be. And then ROP2 challenges are for calling open read and write. And uh, we will have uh, f uh, four, actually, the, the eight more challenges for like a 32 bit and 64 bit each. Uh, and uh, we will cover uh, these challenges in the next week. And the due date of the, the week five challenges are on uh, May 20th. So please take enough time to solve uh, these challenges. Thank you.